This is the All Revved Up Podcast. I'm Reverend Emmett Price. And I'm Reverend Irene Monroe. Irene, about a month ago, the Democratic junior senator from California, Kamala Harris, who also was the former district attorney and the former attorney general of California, born in Oakland. I'm going to say this is very important. Born in Oakland. That's right. She went to Howard University. She went to UC Hastings College of Law. She is being considered not black enough. The absurdity. What does that even mean? <laughs> not black enough? I, I always I always see that as code language. What is it code for? Well, it depends on who's asking the question here. So the first time we begin to hear it, some Republicans mm-hmm. have asked a question. So we've been down this road before. It actually feels like deja vu. The mm. birtherism. Birtherism. Okay. Birtherism, absolutely. Because if we remember now... Barack Obama wasn't black enough. The then, ho- then the junior senator, right? Jun- Absolutely. Junior senator Barack Hussein Obama, right, wasn't black enough. That's right. So, so it's very, very interesting because if you, the flip side of that is that if you're not black enough, what does that mean? And, <laughs> and what does it mean if you are too black? Yeah. So both of them are stereotypes. Clearly we see because... Kamala's uh, mother is Southeast Asian. Mm -hmm. Father is a black Jamaican. Mm -hmm. What about that don't they get? Well, it's clear that the one drop rule is either in effect when it's, you know, for negative means. But uh, when it's a positive time, it's not in effect. I mean, the (laughs) the ironic, you know, idiocy of that. Can I make that word up? Is that a matter of idiocy? But but it carries the the weight of what you're saying here. And you, you know what the thing about one drop? Let me ask you this. Is it gender specific? And the reason why I ask you this is because when it comes to women and the whole idea of this sort of Eurocentric, you know, n- uh, notion of beauty, mm. uh, people would put out folks like Lena Horne mm. or African-American women who had Caucasian type features mm. and they would say, well, they were one drop. It definitely goes back to the, the historical, the, the, American not only slaveocracy, yeah. but colorism, right? So yeah. so at one time, light, light skinned it, right? Light skinned it, black women <laughs> uh, were in and dark skinned it, black women were not necessarily necessarily in and then it flips depending on where you are and depending on the decade or the era or whatnot but i tell you for me but let me ask you this though Mm -hmm. i have to interrupt do you remember the there were two things one is this thing i always remember if you're light bright damn near white Mm -hmm. talking about the humanity h-u-e manatee but do you remember the childhood rhyme Mm. you never sang it i i used to have to sing it Oh, yeah, really? It, in many ways, it told you your place even before you stepped out in the world. How did that go? You, come on. I know you know it. If you're black, stay back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're all right. That must have been during the radio times. I, you know, I come up with the television, Irene, you know. <laughs> well, okay. When I, I'm coming up during the Victrola. How about that? Did you have okay. to crank it? No, listen, I do know that we are of two generations, but that was pretty prominent. And it's very, very interesting because that's why I ask, yeah. is it gender specific? Because when my sister friends and I get around and their younger daughters are around and we're talking, we seem to know that childhood rhyme. I think you are right. I think there is a gender specific piece to it because you know the the thing that you always talk about is intersectionality Mm -hmm. um, of not only just race and social class or whatnot but also the notion of gender and I think that black women women of color but particularly black women have had a different road to trot and I think um, and you spoke about New Orleans a couple of weeks ago Kamala Harris was at the Essence Music and Culture Festival in New Orleans and she called the role of some phenomenal black women she said this she said the fight of black women has always been fueled and grounded in faith and belief in what is possible. It's why Sojourner spoke. Go on now. Why May flew. Amen. Why Rosa and Claudette. And I love the fact that she mentions Claudette, Claudette Colvin she's here. she's always missed. She's yeah. always, you know, left out. Why they sat. Why Maya wrote. Mm-hmm. Why Fanny organized. And why, and why Shirley, Shirley ran. ran. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. And then she phenomenal. said, and why I stand here as a candidate for the president of, of the United, United States. States. That's a radical act in and of itself. I'm Ab- telling you. Absolutely here. But, but let's get back to this whole birtherism, I I felt that there were two things considering the cultural and political climate right now. Mm -hmm. Part of it, too, to me, is a kind of anti-immigration sentiment Mm -hmm. because both of her parents, her father, you know, is a black Jamaican Mm -hmm. who came, I think he went to Stanford. But my point is that there's a level of anti-immigration. And I think the thing that it signals to me, if you remember in February, Donald Trump made this statement saying that why can't some of these immigrants come from Scandinavian countries as, uh, um, uh, as opposed to these SH 
you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, countries. As whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. mm-hmm. that's right, whole countries. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is a, there is a double message there uh, signaling to his base, and it has certainly troubled the water even within our community. Well, I think the fact that Don Jr. is the one who's spearheading this kind of birtherism 2.0. You know what they say. What, what do they say? The fruit don't fall too oh far from, the, from the tree here. Let's leave that tree way <laughs> over there. We're going to leave that tree way over there. But I love what, what Kamala Harris is doing to rebut this because she has said in a number of interviews, I am black and mm-hmm. I am proud of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm glad she can stand up and, and not feel the way I felt that Obama had to do a lot of sort of aerobics, a lot of gymnastics to prove that he was black. So it raises the question, what is authentically, is there an authentically blackness? Is that even a fair kind of question? People talk about an ontological blackness. Mm. What is that? Are we postmodern blackness? Bell Hook talks about that. Right, right. So, so where are we? Are we more fluid with this? And I thought personally that Barack Obama opened up the parameter to define African Americans. His mother is American. His father is African. That's one different. That's one configuration of that. Yeah, yeah. And then you you do have those that immigrate from the motherland yeah. and then stay here or and become citizens. That is also African American. Then there are people like you and I who come from African ancestry. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we all do, but descent of, of slaves. And that's African American. And then there's the whole question around well, how the Caribbean blacks mm-hmm. uh, define themselves. Well, when you think about Barack Hussein Obama, the fact is that yeah. you mentioned that his mother was American. She was white. <laughs> his mother was white. He was raised by two white grandparents yeah. who even in his book, he suggests that they were even racist, even though that he was <laughs> he was, you know, raised by them. Then he was raised not only in Hawaii, but across the world. And so for him to be the first black president is an interesting concept. Yeah. I call him the first biracial president. But was but- there an in- is he inauthentic because he doesn't have what we perceive to be the dominant African-American narrative. Yes, he lived in Indonesia. He lived in Hawaii. But what about that? We are are everywhere. Yeah, I think he is who he is. And I think that's the issue. Let people be who they are. Let Barack Hussein Obama be who he is. Let uh, Kamala Devi Harris be who she is. She She went to high school in in Canada. That's right. right? I was going to say, so some would say some of her formative years, if not all of them or mostly, was in Canada. So, I mean, I I think what it happens is is that I think it pigeonholes us as black people of just arriving from one place, not understanding the vastness of the transatlantic slave trade and, and how that is impacted. I mean, we are moving people. Everybody migrates. Absolutely. As, as a form of opportunity. Absolutely. And her family, her parents came here as a form of opportunity. So I don't I don't quite get it, but but I know I'm always troubled when I hear it. And I and it always signaled to me that there's a subtext. There's something that you're t- you're trying to delegitimize a, a black person. Well, listen, we're not leaving this episode until we get it. So after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to hit this again. You are listening to the All Rev up podcast and we are all revved up you got that right (laughs) we'll be right back irene we're back and i have to calm myself down because these folks are asking is the senator kamala harris black enough just agitating Mm -hmm. they're asking if presidential candidate kamala harris is black enough i mean Let's listen to this clip from her having to rebut and protect herself and defend herself against this very question when she was on The Breakfast Club with Charlemagne the God. So I was born in Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and raised in the United States, except for the years that I was in high school in Montreal, Canada. And look, this is the same thing they did to Barack. Yes. This is, this is not new to us. And so I think that... Um, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to do what has been happening over the last two years, which is powerful voices trying to sow hate and division among us. Mm-hmm. And so we need to recognize when we're being played. What do you think about that? I, you know, in some ways, I think enough is said. But I have a question to ask you, Emmett. Kamala has identified herself. And I don't make assumptions because, as you have even shared with me, we're not a monolith. Mm-hmm. So how do you identify I was born in Los Angeles. 
I was raised in the United States. They did this to Barack. They are trying to do this to Kamala. And you know what they're trying to do. I am black. I am proud. Mm -hmm. I am bold. I'm courageous. I'm creative. I mean, come on now. I mean, you know, my daddy's from New Orleans. You know, my mama's from Alabama. You know, I look at me, a bronze and caramel chocolate. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm black. <laughs> what about you? Well, it's very very interesting. I don't I don't use the term black. I identify myself very intentionally as African American, and I don't hyphen it. I have I put African American to show the disconnection. Okay. To, to show positionality. Okay. Um, that I'm not linked in to what we call America, but I'm an African okay. of African descent. Okay, because you could be a white African, but of African descent. <laughs> no, well, we do you have white, throw, okay, yeah, I know absolutely, that. I know, I know. and American. And I, I'm going to tell you why I use that, and I'm very intentional. I don't like the term black for a couple of reasons, and, and I'll give you an example. I, I've, I, I think if you say, you know, Emmett is a black male, what are we talking about? Are we talking about an African-American male? Number two, I think of it when we say black people, I use it probably synonymous to people of color because a lot of oppressed people will use the term that they're black. So I'm, I'm very much about not using the term, but I will say African-American. And I do this also because, again, I grew up in Brooklyn. And I remember, interestingly, because we had a huge migration, we not as much because Brooklyn now is gentrified, of people throughout the African diaspora coming from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And they would be very, you know, very succinct. No, I'm not African-American. Signaling to me, that's a different experience. But I am Haitian. I am Jamaican. You know, I'm I'm from I'm Bayesian. I'm from Barbados. And so that made me think about, okay, we are very diverse, that we are shaped by not only our different ethnicities, but geographically where that slave trade landed. I differ so much from you because I believe that I can't trace my people's locus of origin on the continent of Africa. So it's kind of hard for me to claim my African legacy. What I can claim is my African cultural uh, lineage. And so in that sense, I use the term black the same way that our ancestors during the Renaissance, both in Harlem and Detroit and D.C., Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Romare Bearden, used the black cultural lens and the black cultural experience to express their differential from other Americans who usually were normatively white yeah. and to say that black is beautiful. Yeah. And so culturally, we look at the African continent and its diaspora through the Caribbean, through the West Indies, through South and Central through, America, through the world, through the world yeah, actually. into the United States, such that my cultural lens uh, traces itself all the way back to Africa. But I do have some Caribbean stuff in there and some la that? La okay. you know, Look at me, look at me flowing here. <laughs> if y'all can see what I'm doing, I'm getting my salsa fific groove okay. on. Okay, but you know what? We can resolve this. Okay. Ancestry.com to be more specific. I am specific not letting here. them, whoever they are, have my DNA. <laughs> you, I'm so sorry. You know sorry. what? I, I'm not either. I don't trust it. I don't I, trust I, it. I really don't. I don't here. trust it. But no, I hear you that. And But the, but the interesting thing is the, the, the sort of the term, the umbrella term back then, if we're going to go back to the Harlem Renaissance, certainly, uh, was Negro. Mm -hmm. We And I, I think the thing that bothers me, we have been colored, we've been Negro, we've been African, Afro-American, black, and, and different. And, and, and I like the lens that you took culture because it's various cultures that define us because I remember, you know, the, the anthem, to be young, gifted, and black. And, black, and yeah. that, was that Nina Simone? Nina Simone. Nina yeah. Simone here. Um, and then I also remember, okay, now you ready? Now this really will date me. and You probably won't born then. But the godfather of soul, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. I, absolutely. On, absolutely. Now, so we had we had dropped the term. By then we had dropped the term Afro-American because I think that that came for first in black. Mm -hmm. And then, then finally, we cultures now, because we have opened, well, part of it has a lot to do with the migration and 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 biracial, yeah, folks. But it sounds to defining me defining themselves it, within a it different sounds to lens. Me that you are coming over to my side. No, and not hang at out all. On, on the on the no, black that, side of no, town. No. no. <laughs> I'm coming to you on the African American side of town here. With, with no stuff. hyphen, though. <laughs> with no hyphen. That's right. <laughs> to show my dislocation, absolutely here, absolutely here, and stuff. But it's very, very interesting because how you identify yourself is very, very important. And I say this as a, as a black lesbian here. I love the fact that Alice Walker in 1984 mm -hmm. gave us the term womanist, womanist yeah. and it's and it says here it's an umbrella term to say yes, I am. I I pick up some of the particularities 
or, or the ethos of, of feminism. But given the intersectionality and the, and the lives of black women, we are womanists. Mm. And, and race has to be within that configuration of sexism and, and misogyny. So, so I, I, and I have learned also being part of the LGBT community, you know, folks will say the LGBTQ, uh, and, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, mm. and transgendered, intersexual, asexual, but then people are non-gendered too. Mm. So, you know, gender queer. So I'm always interested in how people identify. So I thought it was interesting um, for, you know, Charlemagne to ask her and, and appropriate to yeah. ask her. Yeah. But I didn't I did think it was inappropriate for Don Jr. to say she's not black enough. I agree with you on that. And Kamala's last words. And this is what I, I love about her ability to code switch. She is senatorial. She is presidential. Yeah. But every now and then she uses the word played. <laughs> Don't let what she said. She said, we know what they're trying to do. That's right. Don't, Don't let, let them, them play. play. That's right. right. Don't that, let them play you. That's right. Right. Wow. She stands regal to me in the vein of Shirley Chisholm. There you go. Um, who, Come on now. You know, whose slogan back in 72 was unbought and, and unbossed. Un- that's right. And, you know, I have a particular history with Shirley Chisholm because she represented my district in mm. Brooklyn here. And she's the one did a lot of things, not only for our district, but for a little black little girl growing up, the importance of the ballot. She'd always say to us, and I, I campaigned for it, and she said to me, I always remember, it doesn't matter what party you identify with, but <laughs> I'm a Democrat, as she was, but it was always important. And she she explained to us all, us young kids, because she, she spent time talking to us, and there's footage of her talking to us, the importance of voting, what our, what our ancestors went through to get that 1964 Voting Right Act signed. She's so important. And I think she also did this here. This is where the colorism is. Okay. Because Shirley Chisholm, she was born in Brooklyn and she's really from, she, her family's from Barbados, but she is a black skinned woman like mm-hmm. I am. Mm-hmm. And she also did this for me. Shirley, Shirley spoke with a lisp. She uh, did. Yeah, she spoke with a lisp. Oh my with, goodness. Wait, wait, she with did. a Brooklynese accent. So oh. she, so when she say lift up your voice, this is why I'm always talking over you because I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Shirley's fault? It's Shirley's fault. <laughs> I'm calling up the spirit of Shirley Chisholm. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we're just so proud of of our own representative who is in the office that Shirley Chisholm used to have, and that is Sister Ayanna Presley, right. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who was doing phenomenal stuff down, not only down in D.C., but here in Massachusetts I know. where we live. And what I like about what Shirley did is here is that she allows not only for Ayanna to stand because she's a much younger generation, but Ayanna stands on Kamala's shoulder yeah. and Kamala stands on Shirley's. And she allowed even Hillary to rise up. She did. Okay. And even Elizabeth Warren. She did. So she is really when we when we talk about lifting as you climb, mm. she has lifted up a whole bunch of women mm. who who are now in political office. Irene, it sounds like you have something to say. <laughs> well, in our closing, in my closing remarks, I want to say this that may our hearts and minds be open to celebrate similarities and differences among us. May we place our hopes for racial harmony by our committed action toward peace. May we live by compassion, value diversity, promote understanding, and advocate for justice. And may we walk through our days with good intentions. Amen. Amen. And Ashe. Ashe. All Revved Up is a production of WGBH. Our producer is Tori Bedford. Our marketing and social producer is Cavante Smalls. This episode's recording engineer is Doug Shugarts. Music for this episode is from Lee Rosevere. Additional thanks to Nina Prazuki, Kate Ida, John Ryan, Phil Rado, Chelsea Mers, Meredith Nearman, and Zach Wallman. If you like what you hear, let us know. Give us a review. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of All Revved Up.